Broadcasting live from Mike Mongo's Spaceship Studio here in beautiful downtown Los Angeles, Sherman Oaks edition. I'm with Loretta Whitesides, author of The New Right Stuff. Hi, Loretta. Hi, Mike. It's great How to see you. How are you today? Good to I'm see good. you. Fantastic. I Excited know you're that. fantastic. You're always fantastic. Well, I'm on the greatest planet in the universe. What planet what? is that? Earth. Mother Earth. I she is I amazing. Amen. I've, I've seen I a lot forgot. of planets and a lot of stars, and they, they've got nothing on this one. We are, we are on the best, we're in the best place right here. You and I have got to talk a lot, and we are both two of the most excited people about space I've ever met in my life. And you, it, that's what I think one of the reasons that you and I are friends. So before I go any further, I have to, please let me introduce you. You okay. are the author of The New Right Stuff. And so that means there must be an original right stuff or an old right stuff, and you've created the new right stuff. Correct. And you're also, a lot of people don't know, you are a future astronaut. Yes, I am. <laughs> yes, you are. You're gonna, get to, you're gonna get to ride on a spaceship and go to space. And see or the Earth from space and float around weightless. It's gonna be magical. So have you been to space yet? I have not been to space yet, but I have floated weightless and I have been to the bottom of the ocean. You floated weightless before? 80, uh, I've done 80 different trips to float around. I've got about four hours of weightless time in 30 second chunks. <laughs> you have floated weightless 80, more than 80 times? Absolutely. It's what? amazing. You it's better than a trampoline. It's, it's like a what? trampoline in a pool. Combined times a thousand. Really? Better. Because that's a great explanation. I never thought of it like that. It's like a trampoline and a pool combined, even better. I okay. never thought of it before either. I just made that one up right now. That's perfect. I'm drawn forth by all of you watchers to I, think I'm, even I'm, smarter. I'm that's gonna the use power that. you have in the way you listen to me. <laughs> I'm going to tell people that probably for the rest of my life. <laughs> that is definitely the new right stuff. Perfect. So how did you get to fly 80 times? Excuse me. How did you get to be in zero gravity 80 times or microgravity or low gravity? Uh, free fall is another way to call it. Free fall. Um, that's the most accurate way because uh, we're always in gravity. If you think about the moon's whole you know, is held to the earth by gravity. The earth is held to the sun by gravity. There's plenty of gravity out there. There's no shortage of gravity. There's not less gravity in space. There's just as much gravity. The difference is you're in free fall in that gravity well. So uh, if you're in the space station orbiting the earth, you're in free fall around the earth. So just like on the trampoline, you're in free fall when you're coming down. Actually, you're in free fall when you're going up too. You just have a little more momentum going up. Um, but yeah, in the airplane, when we're, uh, we dive from 35,000 feet to 25,000 feet, it's like a big roller coaster in the sky. And when we're on our way, up, just like on the trampoline, on our way up and on our way down, we're in free fall and you're, you're falling. As soon as your foot leaves the trampoline, you're in free fall until you, and then you reach the top of your jump. It's called the apex or the apogee. And then you start coming back down. And as soon as your foot hits the trampoline again, then you're you're back in gravity. I mean, you're in gravity the whole time, but you're back, you feel your weight again. You feel the weight. So in the plane, it's the same. As soon as your foot leaves the tramp, or in the rocket ship, in the spaceship on a suborbital flight um, with Virgin Galactic, as soon as the rocket motor kicks off, boom, you'll feel like, you'll feel like you're floating. You will be floating. We're floating for a few minutes. It's not, it'll be nice, because I've only ever floated for up to 30 seconds at a time. And in my space flight, I'll get to fly, I'll get to float free for at least three and a half, four minutes. And if you think that's not a very long time, you should try holding your breath for three and a half minutes. So as soon as the rocket motor kicks off, I'm floating and I'm looking out the window and I can unbuckle out of my seatbelt and I can float around the cabin and I can stare out at earth and I can look up at the stars because we've got windows, not just on the side of our ship, but we've got windows on the top of our ship. Which ship? Uh, spaceship two, Virgin Galactic's spaceship two. His name is Unity. Okay, so Virgin Galactic is one of the spaceship companies that I tell students about because people think of the only spaceship company as NASA. Oh, there's a lot of them now. We got 
NASA um, has flown people into space. SpaceX is getting ready to fly people into space this yep. month. What? Crew Dragon. So exciting. Virgin Galactic has Spaceship Two, and Blue Origin has a uh, new Shepard, and um, hopefully New Glenn after that. Right. All designed to fly people. So you, so the spaceship have you, have you you haven't flown on Unity yet? I know that because it's only taken it's only had one big flight to space so far. It's had a bunch of test flights. Correct. Yeah, Unity's uh, done two space flights now. And uh, those are just test flights with our test, our test crews. And uh, we're working to get into commercial operations where we'll be able to fly all of our customers. So what was the space flight? What was the airplane flight? What, was the, what did you fly on to do free fall? Mm, right. So that's how astronauts train for space. We use airplanes flying just like airplanes you might have been on, like Southwest or United. Uh, same kind of airplane. It's a 727 except we fly up to 35,000 feet and then dive over to 25,000 feet, which we don't usually do in a commercial airliner. And it's on this airplane that we train for the experience of weightlessness that you can have in space. So and why did you fly? Zero Gravity Corporation. Okay, it was a company. Why did you fly so many different times? Um, because I worked for the company. I was the crew. I was the I was the, I was, I was the safety crew. I was a flight director on board. So I would do the safety briefings and I was trained to evacuate the plane in the event of an emergency. And I take care of all of our passengers to make sure that they're safe and comfortable during our flight. So that's one of the jobs that a person could do to train to be an astronaut. Exactly. So there's a lot of different kinds of jobs like that, that people don't know about. Yeah. And do you think that that job was at, was an advantage for you to be a future astronaut? Oh my goodness. Absolutely. I've got more experience in weightlessness than probably any other person scheduled to fly with us in Virgin Galactic. Wow. When do you um, think that you're going to go to space? Um, I'm hoping I get to fly next year, 2021. That would oh, be wow. awesome. So is that why you wrote the new right stuff? Um, I wrote the new right stuff because I love science fiction. And I love Star Wars. And a lot of my friends, they studied engineering to learn how to build the spaceships that they see in Star Trek. And, in, and I was really excited about the culture that I saw in Star Trek and Star Wars. The way people um, spoke to each other with respect and the way the Jedis were calm and were noble and defenders of peace and justice in the galaxy. And I thought, well, what if we build all these spaceships, but we're still being jerks to each other? That's not going to be very much fun. That's so a good wrote, point. Yeah, I don't want to go to Mars and be jerks. So I wrote the book to help us build the culture of the science fiction future to go along with our spaceships. We could be jerks here. <laughs> we could be jerks anywhere, but it's not as much fun, really. It is it's not. more fun to laugh and dance is what I've learned. <laughs> it is. So you, that's why you wrote the book, is to teach people how not to be jerks? Yep. Really? Yeah, and I, I mean, I wrote the book to help you, people who fulfill what they came to Earth to do. So do you know what you came to Earth to do? Yes. Do you know what your mission is? Yes. And I want to help people fulfill that, because if everybody's fulfilling their mission, their life dream, we'll get everything handled. We'll take care of the whales. We'll take care of the climate. We'll take care of education. We'll take care of kids. Everything will get handled. So I want people, to, everybody to do their piece, and I want them to have fun doing it. Will we take care of turtles? Oh, yeah, turtles, of course. Will we take care of trees? I love trees. trees Are we going to have trees in space? They bring us oxygen. We better have trees in space. Or we're not going to make it very long. Can you imagine a spaceship so big that we had a beach in it? Yeah, like Biosphere 2 had a beach. Yeah. Have you been to Biosphere? I've been inside, but I celebrated New Year's inside Biosphere. So two of our friends were at Biosphere, Jeff Notkin and Cyan Proctor. They did a show there. Oh, great. Yeah, that's a cool place. That's like a spaceship inside a spaceship. Exactly. Yeah, it's a great inspiration for um, how to recreate all of our ecosystems and recycle our air, grow our food, recycle our water when we're away from home, our home planet. Is that the idea of Biosphere to create a little Earth inside a spaceship? 
Mm -hmm. And you can go and visit it? Mm -hmm. And you went to a party at Biosphere? Yeah. Were there animals was inside? The was, were there animals inside? Um, I mean, there's animals like lizards and insects yeah. and things like that. Pollinators, things you need for the plants. I don't think there are any mammals. Are there no. birds? There are birds. Are there butterflies? There are butterflies. Because that would be really cool in space. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't know what a butterfly would do in low, gravi in, in low gravity. I think a butterfly can handle it. Really? Bees, see, I, think I, see, I think you see videos of bees in space. Um, oh, cool. I, I, I have, when I was down at, Nat, at Houston, they were doing the zero G flights, these ones where you train in the airplane for weightlessness. And the student, there was a student experiment and they had fish and they had a camera on the fish. And for part of the airplane flight, you're just flying normal. So gravity just feels normal. And so the fish would just swim normal. But as soon as the plane would go into free fall, the fish didn't know what was going on. And you could tell that they could tell that some, even though they're in water, they could tell something was different. And they didn't know what it was. They just, and the fish would just go, and they would start swimming all around crazy. Because they were like, what the heck just happened? Oh, wow. I've Googled cat in space, and I've seen a cat in, in free fall, like you call, like you say. And I don't know that cats like free fall. I know. A cat is not, not going to like it. I think a butterfly can handle it. The fish did okay. They weren't happy with it. But the cat, no, not going to like it. Story um, Musker always wanted to take a snake. A snake? A snake. He wanted to know what the snake would do. Oh, I think a snake would just hang out. I've always wanted to see a monkey. Because humans and monkeys are similar. Yeah. That I would think be a cool. monkey would really have fun in free fall. I bet you could find a video of a monkey on the plane. I'm pretty sure. Cool. So you are a future astronaut. You've written a book. And so you're an author. And what do you, what do, you do in regular life? <laughs> I don't have a regular life. I have an awesome life. Um, <laughs> what I do is I, I'm, I'm a teacher like you and I teach people the new right stuff. I teach people who build spaceships how to be, use space and their love of space to be their best version of themselves. Oh, wow. You teach people how to be the best version of ourselves. Yeah. That's the new right stuff. Mm -hmm. How to be calm, how to be loving, how to be authentic, like tell the truth, share share my faults and my mistakes and be honest mm. and be honest mm -hmm. that's a big part of it you have a name for everybody who learns all of this yeah we're calling them space kind space kind mm -hmm. like humankind in space mm -hmm. space kind yeah and they're kind they're not oh judged. and being kind being kind is so important you know i we, i mentioned cyan proctor a minute ago and the reason that she got picked in the, last, in the top 16 of 5,000 people that she applied with when she went to be an astronaut at NASA, the reason she even applied in the first place is because when she was in college, one of the people that she was a student with remembered her for being kind. Wow. And so when NASA changed the rules about who can go to space, he hadn't talked to her in 10 years, but he called her and he said, I don't know if you remember me, but I remember you because you were always kind to other people. Wow. Yeah, that really lands for me. People will never forget how you make them feel. That's right. It's funny because I will see people I haven't seen in a long time, but I'll remember how they make me feel. Mm -hmm. That's yep. very important. Yeah, I think that was my Angelo who said that. Oh. Oh, wow. Yeah, she did say that. Yeah, and it's true. You say, they won't remember what you do, but they'll remember how you made them feel. Woo! That's a lot of responsibility. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, is there a lot of the people that watch my show are probably 10 or 12. And they, a lot of the people that watch my show want to grow up to live, work, and play in space. I call them human heirs. Those are the next generation of space explorers. And that's them because they're not grown-ups like us yet. <laughs> they will be. And do you have any suggestions for them? Mm, that's really beautiful, Mike. Yeah, I live with a 10-year-old. So 
Um, you live with a 10 year old? Yeah, and an eight year old. Wow. Yeah, so that's how I have this Lego spaceship because my son built it. Okay, yeah. that's the Saturn V. I didn't build that Saturn V. Uh, my advice for 10 year olds, my advice for 10 year olds is to think about other people. Take care of yourself. Make sure you're brushing your teeth and you're eating well and you're sleeping well and you're getting exercise. And then it's like on the airplane, they say, put on your own oxygen mask first, if you've been on an airplane. And then once you've taken care of what you need, make sure you're thinking about other people. Think about what does your sister need? What does your friend need? What does your neighbor need? What does your mom need? Can you unload the dishwasher? Can you sweep the floor? Can you feed the dog? What can you do to help out and make life work better? Not just for you, but for everyone, because we're all crew of Spaceship Earth. And right now you're training for your life in space, but we're already in space. We're already on a spaceship. Yep. And we gotta train for our space by training to be the best crew we can of this spaceship, Spaceship Earth. Thank you very much. So it sounds like space kind are great team players. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for being on Mike Mongo's Astronaut Adventures with me, Mike Mongo. <laughs> My pleasure. It's always so much fun to hang out with Mike Mongo. Oh, oh, pow. And I hope you'll come back. Absolutely. Super fun. Because it sounds like you have really good adventures. We didn't even get to talk about Yuri's night. No, or going to the bottom of the ocean. Oh, yeah, you've been to the bottom of the ocean, so we have lots more to talk about. Or going to the Arctic Circle. You've been to the Arctic Circle? Yeah, twice. You a scientist? I am a scientist. So here's a question. On this note, a lot of times I will tell students that the way to get to space is to make yourself a kind of person that people want to have around. And that means developing skills and abilities that make us desirable to have on a team. What is your experience with that? This is a, this is a really serious question. Mm. I was yeah. going to wrap it up, but I just had this in my mind. I, I, oh my gosh, what are we gonna, we got to do more. Okay. Um, I love being a scientist. I went to college and I studied biology because I wanted to be an astrobiologist like the biospherians. I wanted to learn how to grow food, grow plants and recycle our air and water. So I learned the language of science. I learned about gravity. I learned about physics. I learned about chemistry. I learned how to talk about measurements and scientific units and how to do hypotheses and research. And because of that, when I work in the space community, I speak their language. I understand what they're talking about when they're talking about force or tests or analysis because I've done it. It's anymore. That training and that background makes me more valuable to the team because I understand what they're dealing with and I can help them and I can speak their language. So it's important to learn to make, get yourself as smart as you can, read as much as you can, learn as much as you can about science, about engineering, even if you're not going to do it, even if you're going to be in politics or you're going to be in business, having understanding those things is the basis of our society and the basis of exploration. And you need to understand them in a really deep level to be able to do more. He's not a lot like me. I had a mom that really encouraged this stuff in me. Did you have somebody like that in your life? Yeah, my grandfather. I called him Abuelito. 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 I called my grandfather Abuelito. <laughs> really? No. <laughs> well, my granddaddy is my one granddaddy, and I have another grandfather, and he's not really my grandfather, but he's always treated me like I'm his grandson, and I call him Abuelito. Perfect. Yes, Abuelito. Um, and he has the same birthday that I do. So I was born on his birthday, so I was like, we were like this. Wow. And he, he loved flying. He always wanted to be a pilot. That was his passion, his love, was exploration in the sky. He was from a different era. And I inherited that gene from him, the exploration gene. And we shared that. And his mascot was the Snoopy, the World War I flying age Snoopy, because he loved yeah. flying. And my mascot was astronaut Snoopy, which is why I have an astronaut Snoopy on my desk. I've got Snoopy astronaut socks. What? That's awesome. <laughs> and because 
I'm of another generation. And for me, the exploration gene is manifested as a desire to go into space. And so Awilito always encouraged me. He was a doctor. And so he'd gone to a lot of school. He was very smart and he was very loving and very warm. And he always encouraged me and supported me to do whatever I wanted or needed to be the best I could be. Gosh, but gosh, that is beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Again, thanks for being on Mike Mongo's Astronaut Adventures. Loretta Whitesides, keep up the good work. Thanks for being an inspiration to us all. Thank you, Mike. You too. It's amazing. Let's play. You got the right stuff. <laughs> Thank you. You do too. Bye. Bye.